Hi. My name is uh, Brian McClendon, and I'd like to welcome you to the Google GOV. Uh, this event is being done because uh, Google is one of the sponsors of the National Geographic Bee that's held uh, every, every year, uh, ending in the finals in May, but going out throughout the year where five million children participate much the way that some of the teams uh, here at Google did. Uh, for this event, we had um, 68 teams compete uh, to get in these seats. And it was a very, very stiff competition. And uh, the highest score for those who are keeping track was 52. And the third place team had to go into a runoff because there are four teams that got 49. So if you want to gauge where you ended up there, that's, that's how it plays out. I'd also like to welcome, we have 150 uh, teachers from the Geo Teachers Institute who are here for two days to learn about. <laughs> they're learning about Google products and uh, learning about uh, the geographic features we have and also being introduced to what it's like here at Google. So hopefully you can give them a taste. I'd also like to thank uh, Mary Lee Eldon with uh, National Geographic who helped organize this and provided the questions and has been a powerhouse in organizing the National Geographic Bee for many, many years. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the prizes. So I'm going to introduce uh, Sven Lindblad. He is the uh, head of Lindblad Expeditions, and they have been uh, running expedition boat trips since the late 50s. He's taken over, and they now have five boats that are of the expedition size, not the big cruise ships. And he'll be able to talk to you about that and talk to you about the prizes that this team will be uh, competing for. So with that, I'd like Sven to come up and uh, give, us a, give us a show. Uh, being here is an incredible experience. Uh, you all have created this ma magnificent enterprise that is essential for all of us. And uh, I'm really impressed with Google Earth and, and more recently, particularly Google Ocean. Uh, I was with Sylvia early yesterday in Washington. We were trying to figure out how to develop more hope spots or protected areas in the Gulf of California. And uh, Sylvia and, her, uh, and I agree on, one th on many things, but one thing we absolutely agree on is it's, it's great to discover the Earth through mechanisms like Google Earth and Google Ocean, but it's even better to get out there and see it for yourselves and feel the power of these wonderful places that uh, need uh, absolutely need our concerns uh, if we are going to thrive in the future. So the idea of being able to provide uh, some prizes, if you will, uh, to the people who are so clever in their geographic knowledge uh, was an appealing notion. Uh, I've collaborated with National Geographic for many, many years and, uh, and also with the folks at Jeopardy and so this just seemed like a golden opportunity. And so we worked together and we came up with these, this idea that we wanted to incentivize uh, people to participate in this. Uh, and then what we wanted to do was make sure that the people who won this had an opportunity, which I sincerely hope you take advantage of if you do win, uh, to go on an expedition somewhere in the world. So can we roll the tape and you can just kind of see where you might go. You gotta look, guys, because that, oh, you can see it there. <laughs> All right. So, all right. So this is not a cruise, in case any of you thought it was. It's, uh, uh, this is probably the wildest place on the planet you can go. Uh, we'll take you there safely. You'll walk, you'll explore, you'll kayak, you'll see lots and lots of cool things. And every single expedition is different. Uh, it's kind of fun because uh, we have uh, filmmakers and photographers on all these expeditions, National Geographic photographers, and we, we actually do contribute, I think, a fair amount to, uh, to Google Ocean nowadays, uh, which is a privilege. Uh, it's quite humbling when you can kayak next to an iceberg the size of a cathedral. Uh, if any of you have kids, this is a great place to bring your kids. I'm sure some of you have kids. If you have time to make kids, I know that you, uh, uh, I know that's not part of the plan, but uh, anyway. Uh, 
made famous by Charles Darwin. You, you realize that more than 50% of Americans still don't believe in evolution. That's kind of interesting. You know, aside from being fun to go to these places, places like the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic, well, all these places are really important to understand because it's in these places that a lot of things are happening that are going to affect our future. I mean, it, it is in these places that you really do understand firsthand the effects of climate change, for example. And those polar bears we love to see, their habitat is absolutely threatened. <laughs> All right, and now, uh, so, uh, so, so three of you are going to get to pick one of those trips, uh, anyone you want, and you can go, and uh, yeah, you, you'll have fun. And then those of you who don't win, uh, you, you, you're going to get a $1,000 certificate that you can use on any of these if you ever want to go, and then all of you who just participated, you'll get a $500 certificate, you can use that if you ever want to come. Uh, and, and hopefully you all will. Uh, now, one last tiny little uh, clip here. Uh, in July of 1978, uh, 2008, we had a summit uh, in the Arctic uh, focusing on climate change. We brought together political leaders, business leaders, religious leaders, and scientists to try and figure out how they could collaborate more effectively around climate change. And we had one absolutely crazy fellow aboard, uh, who was really inspiring, but totally nuts. Uh, and you might know him, and I, I just thought we'd show a little bit about his activities. So what are you going to have to do, Larry? What am I going to do? <laughs> I hope I'm going to go at high speed and not get eaten by a polar bear. So, uh, <laughs> uh, good luck. Good luck and thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I just uh, want to say one point about that. The videos you saw from Antarctica were gorgeous, and they might even look like they're a bit cut from the best of that anybody could ever see. But I went to Antarctica in December, and it felt just like that. And in particular, the video you saw was uh, some emperor penguins. And I know for a fact there was a Googler on that boat who saw those emperor penguins. And so that could be you. With that, I'd like to introduce our teams. And uh, we'll start with uh, the Tea Party imperialists. We have uh, Ian Sharp, Marcus Thorpe, and Rob Harford, and they are the, uh, from, from recruiting, and they've been at Mountain View for a few months, but they have a UK history, and that's where the name came from. Next, we have the Geoids. We have Ed Rubin, Andrew Kermsey, and Chip Chapin. And they're part of Google Earth and Google Maps Engineering. 
finally? Yeah, okay. <laughs> they got a very good score. We have the Titans on, on the far, uh, your far right. We have uh, Rodolfo Oroz. Aki Shoji. And Mike E. Webto Jones. They are uh, part of the legal, uh, legal team. So, uh, and also SPD supporting both Google Earth and uh, um, .org. So with that, I'd like to introduce our host. For 26 years, he's hosted Jeopardy. But more importantly, for the last 22 years, sort of out of uh, the great spirit of education, he's been hosting the National Geographic Bee and turning it from just a competition with kids into a truly exciting end to a wonderful competition. I would like to introduce Mr. Alex Trebek. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome to the Google GOB. It's uh, great to be here in the uh, main eating center for corporate America. <laughs> I have never seen so many cafes, cafeterias, snack bars, and food stands since I spent a week at the Iowa State Fair last summer. <laughs> My gosh, I know you guys work, but you do a lot of eating also. Uh, a little point I should make off the top. Obviously, not everyone got the memo about the dress code for today. <laughs> I guess it was me. <laughs> All right. Uh, as Brian mentioned a little while ago, 68 teams tried out for this GOB. That's a lot of people. And the scores were quite impressive. They compare favorably to the scores that the 12, 13, and 14-year-old kids <laughs> come up with. Now, I'm often asked about Jeopardy uh, for the celebrity tournaments. Do you kind of make the material just a little easier? Duh. <laughs> well, we made the material a little bit easier for this GOB today, but Having said that, these guys were very impressive in the preliminary round. So I'm looking forward to a great competition. Obviously, there are a lot of bright people here at Google. And I mentioned Jeopardy a moment ago. A few of you today asked me, how, uh, how do I try out for Jeopardy? Well, it's very easy. The uh, procedure has been simplified over the years. You can take a, uh, an online preliminary test. It's 10 questions. If you get through that, then you get into the regular testing procedure, which is in three parts. First, there's a 50-question test. You pass that, we put you into a mock game competition against other people who have passed the test. And if you do well in that mock game setup, then our contestant coordinators interview you to see if you have any personality. <laughs> if you have no personality, you cannot be a contestant on Jeopardy. You can host it, <laughs> but you can't be a contestant. All right, as uh, Brian indicated, this is going to be very much like the International Geography Bee, which is held every two years, and which last year was won by a Canadian team. The competition was held in Mexico City. There were 20 different countries competing. The competition itself is in eight rounds for a possible total of 50 points. Six of the rounds will be addressed to teams. Now, you know that we have three teams on stage. The person sitting in the middle is the team captain. For team questions, the captain only will be the one to give the team response. But the team members can confer, and they have 20 seconds to come up with a response for me. There will be two rounds of questions directed to individuals. For those questions, the players are not allowed to converse with their teammates. They have to come up with a response on their own, and they have to do that within 12 seconds. 
Team captains, you can ask me to repeat a clue or spell a word for you, but you can do that only twice during the entire competition. For individual questions, you may ask to have a word repeated or the question repeated only one time. And now the part that I really love, and this is included in every explanation for all of the tournaments that uh, I host. The team with the highest point total will be declared the winner. Huh? George Carlin could have done 30 minutes just on that one line. All right. Good luck to you. Here we go. Round one. Each team... Boy, you're applauding a blue screen. You are an easy crowd. Sort of like my first wife, but that's another story. Ah, in round one, each team will have the opportunity to receive two questions for a total of five points. The topic of part A is world leaders. Each team will be asked to answer a question about a present or past international leader. You'll have 20 seconds to come up with your response. Team A, that'll be you guys. The T people. Hamid Karzai, who was elected president of Afghanistan in 2004, is a member of the country's largest ethnic group. Name this ethnic group for me. Marcos, you get to speak for the team. Answer, please. Pashtun. Pashtun. No points for your team. All right, Andrew, if you are ready, here is the clue for your team. Before being elected the president of South Africa in 2009, Jacob Zuma was the leader of a political organization famous for its opposition to apartheid. What is the full name of this organization? African National Congress. That's two points for you guys. Over to team three now. President Hugo Chavez was born in the Venezuelan state of Barinas, located near the northern edge of a large hot savanna region. Name this region. Aki? Chaco? Not the Chaco, the Llanos. Llanos, L-L-A-N-O-S. All right, in the lead right now with two points, the team in the middle. Let's go to the second part of this series. You're going to be asked to identify which place in a list of four doesn't fit in with the others for the reason noted in the question. If you respond correctly, you'll earn two points, and you'll also have an opportunity to pick up a bonus point for an additional question. All right, team A, open your book to tab one. And tell me, which of the following rivers has an interior delta? Is it the Okavango, the Yangtze, the Limpopo, or the Ganges? Marcos? Okavango. The Okavango is correct, yes. Now, here's your bonus. You've just earned two points. The bonus question. The Okavango is located in which country? Botswana. Botswana is right. Good for you. Three points. Andrew, open your book to tab number one, please. And tell me, which of the following volcanoes is not active. Chaiten, Redoubt, 
Chimborazo or Pacaya? Andrew? Pacaya. No, it's Chimborazo. So no points there and no bonus question. Over to Aki now. Open your notebook to tab number one. Which of the following capital cities was not planned as a new capital city in this country's interior? Is it Abuja, Brasilia, Islamabad, or Santiago? Santiago. Santiago is right. Here's your bonus question. Santiago is the capital of what country? Chile. Chile, correct. There you go. Let's take a quick look at the scores after the first round. We have the tea drinking imperialists with three points, the geoids with two, and the titans with three. Very close game. All right. You know them much better than I do, but I'd like to find out a little bit, a bit about them. So, Aki, tell me about your team, please, the Titans. What department do you work in? What exactly do you do here at Google? Uh, okay, so Rodolfo and I work at Google. Move the, move the microphone in closer. Take the notebook away. <laughs> you are about to say something about you and Rodolfo. All right, Rodolfo. <laughs> What were you about to tell us, Aki? You almost sound like a lawyer. <laughs> no, the lawyers are over here, aren't they? The lawyers are right Oh, you're the lawyers. Hello. Okay. All right. So we work in Google Legal. We support um, mainly geo content in Google Maps and Google Earth, and also .org. And Michael here. Um, is in the content partnerships, SPD and content partnerships, again, mainly working on geo. Whose idea was it to get together and form this team, the three of you? Uh, that would be me. That was yours. Okay, Mike, what's your background? Uh, grew up on a farm in Oregon. And, uh... <laughs> did, you, did you once work for the National Geographic Society? I did, yes. That makes you ineligible. Get out. <laughs> out. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> it's almost as if I'm talking to my dog. Get out. Stay. Good. Good dog. Good dog. Rodolfo, what about you? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Nicaragua. And your background? <laughs> I'm also... You know, it, I know the advice that lawyers give their clients. Just answer the question that is asked. Don't add anything. You can add something here or we're going to have a lot of dead space, dead air. Give me a bit about your background. You have a family. What? Uh, I also grew up on a farm part of the time. Same farm as him. Interesting. Oh, a, little bit, a little bit further south. Uh-huh. Whereabouts? Also in Nicaragua. In Nicara Nicaragua. Nicaragua. It's coffee and cattle. You have a family? I think everyone does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is what pisses you off about lawyers, isn't it? <laughs> Andrew, tell me about the geoids. <laughs> I've had the lawyers up to here. Three of us are engineers. Um, Chip works in maps, and Ed and I both work in Google Earth. And uh, I guess we, we had a, there was a trivia contest at a bar that we won a few months ago, and figured that was good enough. So now we're here. Was there any drinking involved when you won that trivia? Not that, that I remember. <laughs> not, not that you remember. OK. Whose idea was it for you guys to maybe try out for this I thing. thought we would get the band together again. Huh? Okay. Who's the, uh, who's, the, there's always a funny guy in any group. Now, in this group, Ed is the funny man? I guess. <laughs> Does that mean you drink more than the others? No. Yes. No. I'm... Whoa. <laughs> he Your doesn't partner. remember. <laughs> he doesn't remember either. Okay. I try and be funny without the drink. You try to be funny without the drink. What are you working on right now, Chip, that you can talk about that uh, would make sense to me? 
I, I'm Remember, working, I'm computer illiterate. I'm working on how to make uh, ads in Google Maps ever more beautiful and uh, lucrative. Ads in Google Maps. Yes. So it would be, there would be a little uh, a pop-up window that would say Christopher Columbus landed here and saw this sign, McDonald's. That's right. And right, and right below that, there'd be the ad for um, you know, Christopher Columbus pantyhose or something like that. <laughs> Oh, they're not bad. Marcus, tell me about your team. Um, See if you can do it with an American accent. Uh, that's not a good idea. Ah, all right. <laughs> um, we're a group of uh, three recruiters. We used to work together in London, um, and we thought it was about time that we came over here and sort of showed the benefits of a British education. <laughs> <laughs> that's what pisses us off about the Brits, isn't it? <laughs> My wife and I love visiting England, and I believe one of you is from a part of the country that we enjoy, close to Yorkshire, heading north. Which one? Anybody? Manchester? Um, I'm from Birmingham. Birmingham. Right in the middle. In the middle, okay. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I, uh, I moved here for, for the tea, not, for, not because of the education. For the tea. Exactly. All right. How did you get interested in geography? Um, so I've never studied geography. It was, I think, probably my least favorite subject at school. <laughs> have you traveled extensively? Um, actually, I have, yeah. So, um, not, not wanting to get away from Birmingham, but I, I think I've traveled... Um, <laughs> so, I've traveled, um, I think, 32 countries and about 135 cities. And you pay attention and you remember most of what you've seen. I guess something stuck. Something must have stuck. All right, pass the microphone down there to Rob. Let's hear about you, please. What would you like to know? Everything. Oh. <laughs> in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Go. Well, uh, I was born in the UK, and I've lived in the UK, and also in France, and in Germany for a little bit. And then I moved back to the UK, and then I thought I'd move here for a bit of a change. Tell us about France for a foreigner, particularly someone from England. Where did you live in France? In uh, Paris? Because the Parisians hate everybody, including their fellow Frenchmen. <laughs> but other parts of the country are much friendly. Yeah, no, I lived, uh, most of the time I was there, I lived just outside Paris. I did live in the middle for a year as a student as well in Limoges. Limoges. Yeah. Pretty city. Yes, very nice. A great porcelain. Put the microphone in the middle, and let us continue now to round two. This is in two parts also, ladies and gentlemen. It's worth a total of four team points. Four team points in part A and part B. You will get to look at a photograph as I read the question for you. A correct answer, two points. All right, Marcos, open your notebook to tab number two. Take a look at that photograph and listen. From the Afrikaans word meaning hammerhead, the Hammerkopf's native range is throughout sub-Saharan Africa, including which country located directly south of Egypt on the Red Sea? Sudan. Sudan is right. Let's go over to Andrew. Open your book to tab number two. Take a look at this photograph. Pretty. And now listen. <laughs> The shoebill, named for its unique beak, can be found in wetland areas in East Africa, including which country that borders both Lake Victoria and Lake Malawi? Mozambique. Ah, uh, no, you're too far east. Tanzania. Tanzania is the response we were looking for. All right, Aki, open your notebook to tab number two, and take a look at this photograph, and listen to this. The rhinoceros hornbill is one of the larger species of hornbills and can be found in parts of Southeast Asia, including the state of Sarawak where it is the official state bird. Which country includes this state? Uh, 
Malaysia. Malaysia's right. Good, two points for you. All right, let's move to part B. We will be depicting rivers from around the world. Marcus, open your notebook to tab three. Take a look at this photo. A man fishes in the rapids of a river below the ruins of a feudal castle in France. Name this river. It's the longest in France. The Loire? The Loire is right. Andrew, tab three. In this photograph, clouds float above a river meandering through the Peruvian rainforest. Name this river, considered one of the main headwaters of the Amazon River and formed by the confluence of the Apurimac and Urubamba rivers. Orinoco. No, it's not the Orinoco. It's the Ucayali. Ucayali. Aki, tab three, please. Paper lanterns representing the souls of victims of the first atomic bomb used in warfare float past the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park on what Japanese river that flows into the inland sea? Aki? Tonegawa? I'm sorry? Tonegawa. No, the Ota. Ota River. All right, that uh, concludes this round. The tea drinkers are in the lead, those imperialists, yes. Seven points, seven to five. All right, individual questions coming up now, which means each of you gets a question in turn. You may not confer with your partners. So we'll start with you, Ian. Name the Protestant Christian denomination, followed by the majority of the people living on the Scandinavian Peninsula. Hurry. Say something. Haas. No, Lutheran. Lutheranism. All right, let's go over to Ed now. The island of Bali is culturally distinct from others in Indonesia because most of its residents practice a form of which major religion? Hindu? Yes, Hinduism is correct. Rodolfo. <laughs> Creating a sovereign state named Khalistan in the Punjab region is a goal proposed by some followers of which religion? Sheik. Sikh. The, the correct response is Sikhism, and, but he put an SH sound. He's Spanish, Rodolfo. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> Topic for our next series is deserts. Marcos. The Ran of Kutch is a large marshy area at the southern edge of which desert located in the state of Rajasthan on the Indian subcontinent? I don't know. It's the Tar, T-H-A-R, desert. Andrew, your question. The cold Peru or Humboldt ocean current creates a thermal inversion, inhibiting precipitation over a major desert located on the Tropic of Capricorn, northwest of the Pampas region. Name this desert. Atacama. Atacama is right. That's two points for you. Aki, 
The historic Silk Road split into two branches that ran along the edges of a large desert located between the Tian Shan to the north and the Kunlun Mountains to the south. Name this desert. I know it's in China. It's the Takli Makan. Hmm. Takli Makan. All right. Third round of questions will deal with migrations. Rob. For many years, the Indonesian government supported a transmigration program that moved people from a densely populated island that borders the Sunda Strait. Name this densely populated island located south of Borneo. Us. Java. The island is Java. Over to you, Chip. <clears throat> a country from which many of its residents were forced to flee during years of military conflict now has the largest number of returned refugees in the world. Name this landlocked South Asian country that borders Iran. Afghanistan. You're right. Yes. Mike? Which South American country bordering Venezuela is estimated to have approximately three million people who have been internally displaced by decades of internal armed conflict? The country is Colombia. Colombia. All right, that concludes the third round of questioning. Let's take a look at the scores. Still very, very close, but right now the geoids are in the lead by a point. <laughs> round four coming up is a team round in two parts, worth a total of six points. In part A, you'll be asked to identify an error on a map. <laughs> the arrow, the arrow will always point north. The scale is always in kilometers. Three points for a correct response. Marcos, open your notebook to tab four. Take a look at this map and describe the major error on this map. Any response? Um, there, are, there are two countries to the east of Tanganyika. There should be one. No. The two countries, the two little countries almost in the center, Rwanda and Burundi, should be on the other side of Lake Tanganyika. Sorry about that. Andrew, <laughs> open your notebook to tab four. Describe the major error on this map. Lake Nicaragua's in the wrong place. It's supposed you're, to be further west. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Adding to your lead a little. Aki, tab number four, please. Describe the major error on this map. Aki? Montenegro? We're missing, we're missing uh, Montenegro? No, the mouth of the Danube River is in the wrong spot. <laughs> but there's also no Montenegro. <laughs> Maybe it's just as well I didn't hear what he said. <laughs> but now, ladies and gentlemen, you have some idea of how tough it is for those 11, 12, 13, and 14-year-old kids who have amassed all this knowledge 
about geography. All right, we're going into part B of round four, and in this part, you're going to look at a set, you're going to love this, a set of three bar graphs. Each set of graphs compares the average percent of arable land, average GDP per capita, and average population density for all of South America. And there will be statistics for an unidentified country. The unlabeled bar on the top of each pair represents the country you are going to try to identify. All right? The unlabeled bar represents the country you are seeking to identify, while the lower bar represents the average value of that statistic for all countries in South America. Okay. Turn to tab number five, please, Marcos. Take a look at those graphs. Which country is represented by this set of bar graphs? Is it Colombia, Uruguay, or Venezuela? Three points. Columbia. Columbia's right, yes. Well done. That's a tough one. Tab five, Andrew. Can you maintain your lead? Which country is represented by this set of bar graphs? Is it Guyana, Paraguay, or Peru? Paraguay. Paraguay, correct. Three points for you. Aki, tab number five. Which country is represented by this set of bar graphs? Would it be Argentina, Ecuador, or Suriname? Argentina. You wasted no time on that. You're right. Well done. <laughs> Okay, we now come to round number five. This is the second round in which the questions will be directed to individuals. Captains, open your books at tab number six, I believe, and you will see a box that contains 12 squares, all right? There is a question associated with each category. When I ask you to pick a box, you select the category and I will give you the question. You will have 12 seconds to come up with a correct response. Once that question is done with, however, that box is no longer in play, so the next player will have to select from the remaining boxes. Ian, we're going to start with you. Pick a box, please. Cities. Cities it is. Here is your question. Founded by the Portuguese on the site of the ancient city of Anfa, Morocco's most populated city is located northeast of the Canary Islands. Name this city for me. Casablanca. Casablanca is right, sweetheart. Ed. Pick a box. Famous explorers. Here's your question. What explorer set out from Morocco and spent nearly 30 years traveling to such places as Mecca, India, and present-day Tanzania? Uh, Livingstone? No, Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta. Sorry. Chip, you knew that? I did. You did? Too bad you guys couldn't confer. Rodolfo. <laughs> Pick a box. Okay, thank you. Islands. Islands it is. Bouvet Island, which is located just west of the Atlantic Indian Ridge and north of the Weddell Plain, is a territory of what country? 
Repeat the question, please. Yes. Bouvet Island, which is located just west of the Atlantic Indian Ridge and north of the Weddell Plain, is a territory of what country? India? No, it's Norway. Norway. All right, Marcos, over to you now. Pick a box for me, please. Languages. All right. In 1887, Dr. Ludwig Zamenhof introduced an international language to facilitate communication between speakers of different languages, but no country has officially adopted that language. Name the language for me. Esperanto. You're right. Two points for you. Andrew. Mountains. The Owen Stanley Range is located north and east of the capital city of Port Moresby. In what country is this mountain range located? New Caledonia? No, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, nice try. Aki, pick a box. World Heritage Sites. Stone islands, grottos, and limestone caves have made Ha Long Bay a World Heritage Site. This bay is located near the Gulf of Tonkin, in which Asian country? Indonesia? No, Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin, Vietnam. All right, we come to Rob now. I'll try conservation, please. Cienega de Zapata, a diverse ecosystem including grasslands and mangrove forests, is located in the province of Matanzas, west of Santa Clara. This large Caribbean biosphere reserve is in which country? Cuba? Cuba's right. <laughs> Chip? I'll take exclaves. Cabinda, located on the Atlantic Ocean between the Republic of the Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is an oil-rich enclave of what country? I'll say Nigeria. No, Angola. Angola. You were too far north. Okay, Mike. Pick a, pick a box. Historical geography. Which religion declared the state religion of Japan following the Meiji Restoration in 1868 was officially separated from the state after World War II? Buddhism? No, Shinto. Shintoism. All right, that wraps up round five, and the tea-drinking imperialists are in the lead with 16 points, 14 for the geoids, 10 for the titans. Round six coming up now, players. This is a team round. In part A, I will ask each team a question about money. Money from around the world. The photographs of the foreign banknotes will be projected for the audience. The images of these banknotes have been altered to remove words that would give away the answer, the correct answer to the question. So, open your notebook, Marcos, please, to tab number seven. Take a look at this banknote. The dragon tree seen on this banknote is native to several Atlantic island groups and can be found in an African country that includes the islands of Sal and São Nicolau. Name this country. Can we get the question again, please? The dragon tree seen on this banknote is native to several Atlantic island groups and can be found in an African country that includes the islands of Sal and São Nicolau. Name this country. Morocco? No, Cape Verde. 
Cape Verde. Andrew, tab seven. The harbor area shown on this banknote is Hope Town, a small town on the Abaco Islands of which country in the West Indies? Bahamas? Bahamas is right. <laughs> Aki, tab number seven, please. Take a look at this photo. Kaichur Falls, depicted on this banknote, dropped more than 740 feet into a gorge located on the Potaro River, in which South Trinidad and Tobago. You are right. Three points for you. We move on now to round seven. It's a team round in two parts. It's worth a total of seven team points, an opportunity for the Titans to do some catching up. Marcus, open your notebook, please, to tab number eight. We're going to show you a demographic profile of a country represented by a population pyramid. You have a choice of two countries. You have to choose which of these countries the population pyramid represents. Which country does this population pyramid represent? Would it be Germany or Gambia? Germany. Germany is right, yes. Fairly evenly dispersed. Tab number eight, please, Andrew. Which country does this population pyramid represent? Chile or Somalia? Hmm. Somalia. No, sorry. Correct response is Chile. 
Aki, tab number eight. Which country does this population pyramid represent? Bulgaria or Cameroon? Cameroon. Cameroon is right. Four points for you. That takes you to three points out of second place. Let's go on to uh, part B now. You're going to be asked to identify a city on the map of Europe. Once again, on the maps, all arrows point north, and the scale is in kilometers. A correct response will earn a team three points. You'll have 20 seconds to confer, and the maps will be projected, as always, for the people in the audience. All right, Marcos, you can see the map. You can turn to uh, the next tab, tab number nine. Get a close-up look at it. I want you to give me the number and the name of the city that was the de facto capital of the puppet state set up by the German government and which was led by Henri Philippe Pétain during World War II. France Vichy. I need the number. 17. Sorry. 17 is right, yes. You had the country, the city. Tab number nine, Andrew, you have it, good. Give the number and name of the city from which Christopher Columbus set sail on his second and fourth voyages to the West Indies. Andrew. 16 Cadiz. 16 Cadiz. Did Chip tell you to say that? Yes, he did. Yeah, Chip was right. All right. <laughs> Chip's a good guy to have there. <laughs> Aki, tab number nine. Give the number and name of the Scandinavian city, formerly known as Nidaros, that was a major trade hub and a national capital in the Middle Ages. Number 14, Oslo? No, it is number six, Trondheim. Trondheim. All right, let's take a look at the scores, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of seven rounds of play. The tea-drinking imperialists have a lead, but it's not a commanding lead, because in this eighth and final round, we have a potential of 10 points. Ten points, still within reach for the Titans. Also, the Geoids not far off the lead. In this round, the teams are going to be asked to identify a feature after listening to the same set of clues. There are five clues. After I read each clue, each team will have 20 seconds to confer, decide whether it wants to risk a response for that point value, and you have cards in front of you, right? Good. You have one for each question. You'll only need one to start. If you choose to respond and try to come up with a correct response after the first clue, you have the potential of earning five points at the second clue, four points, and so on down the line. You'll all hear the same question at the same time. You'll be able to confer. Now, once you make your decision, and write it down on the card, you're done for the rest of the question. You cannot change your mind, all right? Here we go. From the following set of clues, we want you to identify the river. Here is the first clue for five points. This African river forms part of the international boundary for three different countries. Talk about it and see if you want to risk coming up with a response worth five points. I will read it again. African River forms part of the international boundary for three different countries. Yeah. 
Does anyone want to try to come up with a response and try to earn five points? Anyone? Or do you want to wait for the next clue? Aki, are you going to try to come up with a, a response for five? Give me a yes or a no, please, Aki. Counselor. Okay, I'm trying to get the correct pronunciation. Are you going to try for the five points? Yes, All right, no. write down your response, please. Don't tell us what it is. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Just the five-point card, the one that says five. Write down your response. Anybody else? No? No? Okay, just Aki. The name of the river. Name of the river. Just put it there. In fact, just put it like this. You're going for five. Good. Now, these two teams will have an opportunity for four points on this clue. This river rises in the mountains of a landlocked country. Talk it over. Possible four points. Should you? No, you're done. You're done. You've done your work. You took a chance on the five-point clue. If it works for you, good news. You're going to try for four. Have you written down your response already, Andrew and Marcos? You're going to pass on this and wait? You're going to wait? All right. Here is the third clue. The clue is now worth three points. The Gariup Dam is the largest dam on this river and has the ability to produce up to 360 megawatts of electricity when at full capacity. The Gariup Dam. G-A-R-I-E-P. Go on to the next clue. The fourth clue, the question is now worth two points. This river flows through the southern Namib Desert. So you're going for the two points. Let's take a look and see. For two points, you wrote down the... Or <laughs> you wrote down the Orange River, South Africa. Orange River is correct. Two points. Andrew, you are going for four points. We need to see the Orange River. And you came up with the Zambezi instead. No points for you on that one. Aki is not looking all that happy. <laughs> I hope that smile continues. And you selected the Zambezi also. Sorry. So no points for you. Two points for the leaders. 28 points total. Get another set of cards ready. These you have used. So get the next set of cards ready. Now we want you to identify a city. A city. Here is the first clue for five points. Although this city has no airline or rail services, over two million people visit each year. Talk about it. Although this city has no airline or rail services, over two million people visit each year. Andrew is going for five points. Aki, you are going for five. And Marcos, your team is going to pass on this one. All right. Okay, geoids and titans, relax. Here is the second clue for four points. 
Due to this city's location on a desert trading route, many residents were merchants, the most famous of whom was born around 570 A.D. pass. Now, what do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Is Marcos and his teammates, are they playing a game of strategy here? They lead by five points. If they pick up just one point, just one, they cannot lose. Is that what he's doing? We will see. For three points, Abraham and his son Ishmael are believed to have built one of this city's sacred structures. Going to wait. Over one billion people around the world face in the direction of this city when they pray. Marcos was telling his teammates, hey, we have one more, you know, and we're, we're still safe. But he's going for two points. So it's very important for the Titans to see if they can pick up five points. No matter what, you're going to finish in third place. But <laughs> you picked an obvious one and a very good response, but it's incorrect. You said the Vatican. And that is wrong. How many of you in the audience, by a show of hands, how many of you thought it was the Vatican? A number of you. Okay. After the first question, yes. And does that mean you guys picked the Vatican also? Vatican City. Yeah, after the first question, that was a toughie, but you knew what you had to do. The correct response, of course, is Mecca. And they got it. We threw the rascals out of our country a few hundred years ago, but the Brits keep coming back to enjoy what America has to offer, including a first place finish in the first ever Google GOB. Tea drinking imperialists, congratulations. Well done. Now, I mentioned earlier that the kids do really well. In the last International Geography Bee, the one won by the Canadians in Mexico City, the Canadians accumulated, with all of this material, 37 points. Not much better than the tea drinkers here. The second place team was the United States team. They finished with 25 points. And the third place team, making it to the finals for the first time, Poland, they came in with 24 points. So you guys, all nine of you, did fabulously well. Much better, really, than I anticipated because I had no idea there were so many geography experts here. Congratulations to you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope all of you did. And I don't know, I don't know how much time... Sven, how much time do they have before they make their selection as to which of those three fabulous trips they get to enjoy the Norway Svalbard, the uh, Galapagos Islands, or Antarctica. Let me, if you haven't been to any of those three, I've been to the Galapagos. Fantastic trip. Uh, two of our staff members at Jeopardy went to Antarctica last year. Both said, and they've done a great deal of traveling, the best vacation of their lives. 
No one that I know of has been to Norway and the Svalbard area, so I can't comment on that. So think about it. I mean, no matter which one you select, the people at Lindblad will treat you like royalty. You'll have a great time. And speaking of great times, that's what I've had here this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This was fun. And you guys, you guys are cool. And I appreciate the, the little learning sessions I had earlier today on how to access Google Earth and a lot of the other marvelous features. I told a couple of small groups that I play spider solitaire, but now I think since I have a, a new uh, computer as of a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to broaden my horizons and start exploring more and discovering and enjoying what you folks have created. So my thanks to all of you. So I'd, I'd like to ask Alex to uh, come back up for just a minute here. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Google is in many offices. Uh, we have uh, 40 around the world. One in particular is very large in Europe. It's uh, in Zurich. And the time there is a bit after midnight on July 22nd uh -oh. of uh, year 2010. This is uh, Alex's 70th birthday in Zurich. So we'd like to celebrate and wish him a happy birthday. Could you all sing, please? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alex. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. A little sidebar for all of you. Uh, my wife has a habit of trying to surprise me on my birthday. And I told her this year, I said, even if it's, if it's the 70th, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't do anything. And she said, OK. But last week on Saturday night, I had to attend a dinner that some friends of ours who are very big contributors to, to one of her charities, they had purchased a table at a charity auction at the uh, Getty Center for dinner there. And uh, so, okay, we're going up there. My kids had gone out to the uh, mall downtown uh, in LA, and they were going to the movies, and everybody was going to have a good time, and I was going to drink and enjoy myself. <laughs> and by golly, we got to the Getty Center, and we opened the door, and surprise. Oh. Uh, and the last time she did a surprise number on me was for my 65th, and I, I kind of figured it out in advance, but this time I was completely blown away. Uh, 70 is a cool age. For those of you who need advice on things like this, and uh, I remember telling this to Diane Sawyer from ABC News, I said, Diane, skip the 60s. The 60s suck. <laughs> Because your body starts to fall apart and you develop all kinds of ailments. Jump from 59 to 70 and everything will be all right. And uh, I'm flying back to Los Angeles tonight. Tomorrow we'll have a nice quiet dinner, just the family, celebrating my 70th. But for you guys to have acknowledged it with this uh, makes it very special also for me. So I'm going to, well, I'll let you cut. The teams should have some pieces to start, but we're going to need uh, to cut it. Please. They, they closed everything up. There are no knives and forks available. <laughs> but, uh, we, we also have cupcakes for the audience. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Google is feeding its workers? <laughs> it has been a few What's hours. What's this world, world coming to? How unusual. Salute. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Where are the cupcakes? Where are the cupcakes? The cupcakes are sitting uh, back here on the table, so thank you all very much for coming.